Hello, I'm John Warden. The purpose of this presentation is to help you begin to create and execute winning strategies using the Prometheus process. You know, many of us think that our key to success is simply doing the tactical aspects of our job well, making good sales calls, doing good customer service. All of these things are, in fact, extraordinarily important. However, by themselves, they are highly unlikely to bring you the degree of success that you would like to have. If we are going to be successful, if all the hard work that we go through in building good tactical approaches to customer service, sales, production, and quality are going to pay off as they should, they must be part of an overarching strategy. If you don't have a strategy in your organization, by definition, then, you are tactically focused. Each of the arrows on this slide depict different people or different divisions within your organization that are all working very hard with their tactical jobs, whether those jobs be sales, marketing, production, quality, accounts receivable, or anything else. You see that all of these arrows are going in different directions because in the tactically focused organization, everyone has no choice but to optimize at their own level. The result is, as they do their work, that they are going forward in such a way as not to take the organization to a higher level. And as you can see here, that all of that hard work does not create much in additional success for the organization in terms of profit or of anything else. On the other hand, in the strategically focused organization, those same people, those same organizations are still doing the kind of work they did before. They are still doing their tactical jobs in a good way, but now the strategy of the organization has aligned them in such a way that as they do their work, they are carrying the organization to higher and higher uh, achievements in the way of profits or successes or whatever else it is that the organization is trying to accomplish. Some people may think that strategy is an extraordinarily difficult thing, and indeed, actual strategy, once it's developed, can be quite complex. But at the highest level, strategy is straightforward. Strategy is a game plan to create a future that would not exist in the absence of the strategy. And we can simplify it even farther. At the very basic level, strategy consists of four single words, where, what, how, exit. Where? Where do we intend to be at some point in the future? What? What are we going to put our resources against? How? How are we going to execute our strategy and how are we going to manage time and exit? Do we have identified exit points and exit plans for all aspects of our operations well before we begin them? We can take these four simple words now and make them more understandable by putting them into a pictorial or a graphical format. So where? Where do we intend to be at some point in the future? This becomes our future picture. As we might assume, if we are going to get to some different place in the future, something around us is going to have to change. That's the outside world. That's the world of systems. The systems, when we first look at them, seem to be very complex, but in fact, we can break those two systems down into two smaller parts, into an external system, our markets, and into an internal system, our own organization. To further simplify these two systems, we can break them down into what we call centers of gravity, the relatively small number of points in each one of these systems that when we do something to them create desired system change. In order to create the change, we need to manage the centers of gravity within a specific time frame. So the how is changing the centers of gravity in order to change the systems, external and internal, in such a way that it sets up the conditions that allows us to accomplish our future picture. And then finally, exit. Everything has a start and an end. Some things will end well, some things will end poorly. As strategists, it's our job to make sure that as much as possible ends well 
and then when things do not go as well as they could, that we don't suffer the consequences any more than is necessary. So this then is the pictorial presentation of the Prometheus process. In strategy, we always begin with the future. In the Prometheus process, the future we term the future picture. So what is the future picture? The future picture is really a beacon. Like any beacon, it's something that everybody can see and that attracts people from all over an organization, tells them where that they are going to end up. Not how they're going to get there, but where they are going to end up. If this beacon is going to be useful, it has to have a number of characteristics, which you can see here. It needs to be clear. It needs to be compelling. It needs to be measurable. It needs to have high resolution. It needs to be something that everybody in an organization can understand, and not only understand, but see how that they can benefit from it. It needs to have time frames that are understandable and acceptable to people in the organization, and it needs to be something in which everybody believes. So let me give you an idea about what a future picture really is. As you can see, you see nothing. You're looking at a blank white screen. Now, let's make an assumption that you and the people who may be watching with you decided that you were going to do something exciting uh, next week, like go on a picnic. You might say that you had relatively little time to do the planning for the picnic, so you would divide yourself up into four different groups of one, two, three, ten, whatever the number happened to be available. One group would go off, and it would work on where the picnic was going to take place, another one on what the food was going to be, another one on the transportation, another one on the drink. Fifteen minutes later, people would come back and they would report on what that they saw as the picnic for next week. One group says, we're going to a local farm that has a wonderful hayride situation. The second group says, the, for transportation, that the corporation says we can use the jet, go any place in the world. The third group said that they had found a wonderful supply of Verve Clicquot champagne, and the fourth group said they'd gotten a great deal on Oreo cookies. Now, all of those things could actually be the underpinnings of a pretty nice picnic, but they simply don't match together. So how would we ensure that the planning that we did for our picnic makes a little bit more sense? Well, the way we might do it is something like this Renoir's uh, portrait of the luncheon party. So we see this, and we can see uh, it's in a nautical setting. People are dressed in interesting ways. Uh, there is interesting food and drink on the table. This then would be our future picture if we all agreed that this was a good idea for a picnic. Now, when we broke up, and we did our planning, we might come back with a variety of interesting ideas, and it might not look precisely like what we are seeing in this Renoir, but it would be something that would be cohesive, coherent, and it would come together in a dramatically different way because we had a future picture against which all of us were working. Now, unfortunately, in the corporate world, it's very difficult actually to paint or draw a picture. So what we do is we break down the future picture into 12 key descriptors. These key descriptors take the place of geometric shapes, of colors, of brush strokes in an actual painting. You can see that they here are represented in terms of things like workforce characteristics, financial position, corporate culture, and so on. There are 12 of them, which we have found make a pretty good comprehensive future picture for an organization of any size, from the very small to the very large. We'll discuss the details of these momentarily. Now let's talk a little bit about the details of the key descriptors. The first one is financial position. This has to do with the future dollar value of your enterprise. It has specifics in it, things like the equity value, the profit value, the debt value of your organization. You want to make this financial position, as indeed all of the other uh, key descriptor elements, as much an end state thing as possible. And as you go through these and build them, you always want to ask yourself, am I certain that I'm going to be happy if this is in fact what I achieve? 
So financial position, in general, we're more interested in profits than we might be in total sales. We're more interested in the value of our organization than we might be in other more tactical elements of it. Our market position tells us where we will be at some point in the future. Are we going to lead the market, being the first ones to put out new products and services? Are we going to be a follower? Uh, are we going to be even a scavenger? Any of these positions are perfectly logical and make plenty of sense if it's what you intend your organization to be. What you don't want is there to be confusion with some people thinking that the objective is to be leading while the other part of the organization thinks that the objective is to be second, third, or fourth to market once the bugs are out of something. The next key descriptor is business areas. These are the business that you intend to be in, the ones that you passionately intend to pursue or exit. This is an excellent point, if you have been in business for a while, to look at elements of your business that you really don't like, you wonder why you are in them, and when you hit on these, it's time to say, let's try something else, let's get out of these. Innovation. How are you going to be from the standpoint of creating new ideas, new concepts, uh, new products? You could be pursuing sustaining innovation, in other words, continuing product improvement, or you could even be pursuing disruptive innovations, trying to come up with something that simply doesn't exist and will change the way a market or a particular segment of a market actually works. Your innovation ideas can come from external or internal sources. This is the time when you decide how you are going to approach the concept of innovation, not the details of it. The next key descriptor is insider perception. How do you intend for yourself and the other people in your organization to think about themselves from the standpoint of the organization? Is it something that they want to be in? Is it something in which they take great pride? Is it something that they intend to spend a long time in? How do the insiders are going to think about themselves with respect to the organization? Outsider perception. All of those people that are outside the organization will have some kind of a view about you. What do you want it to be? Do you want them to think about you as a high-quality organization that delivers good value? Do you want them to think about you as a commodity organization? There are all kinds of things that you would like them to be thinking about. Remember that your future picture, however, is what you intend the world to be, inside and out, at a particular point in the future. Our next key descriptor is workforce characteristics. This is what the future workers are going to be in your organization. What kind of talents are they going to have? What kind of people are they going to be? Our next idea for key descriptors is brand. Are we going to have a brand? If so, is it going to be a channel brand, a product brand, an organization brand? You don't need to have a brand, but if you're going to have one, this is the time to make that decision. Corporate culture. How do you intend to run your organization? Is it going to be dictatorial? Is it going to be open planning? Is it going to be collegial? All of these are perfectly reasonable choices, but you need to decide what it's going to be, and then do what is necessary in order to make it happen. The next key descriptor is uh, corporate citizenship. These are the non-business, the philanthropic things that are associated with your business. Are you going to make contributions to charities? Are you going to participate in community works? You certainly don't have to, but again, this is the place to get clarity so that everybody in the organization knows what your approach is to what otherwise may be a rather contentious area. Ownership. On the surface, it seems fairly straightforward. You might be public, you might be private, and again, you might be a government organization, you might be a non-government organization, you may be a not-for-profit organization. You need to define clearly what that is and be certain of what, it, of what you want your organization to be in terms of ownership at some point in the future. And then our last key descriptor is that of incentive philosophy. How are people going to be rewarded? Is it going to be a straight salary? Is it going to be some uh, connection with, with risk? Is it going to be a function of how well the organization does, is how well individuals do? 
This is the time not to work out the details, but to determine the overall philosophy of how you are going to be in the future at the time of realization of your future picture. We have just covered the where, the future picture. Clearly, the future picture is going to be something dramatically different than what you currently have. Otherwise, you wouldn't be going through the process of trying to create strategy. A little thought would tell you that if you are going to be producing a different future for yourself, that a lot of things need to change. The external market needs to change. If you are currently making $1 million or $10 million or $100 million, and your objective is to make two million, two hundred, or one billion dollars, then that market, the external world, clearly needs to be sending you more money. It's not going to do it on its own. Something needs to change about it. Likewise, if you are going to be doubling your sales over the next three, five, or seven years, you clearly are going to have a different internal organization than the one that currently exists. To achieve your future picture, Two systems must change, an external system and an internal system. We change these systems by identifying and affecting the centers of gravity that are resident within each one of these systems. You might think that it's quite difficult to change systems, especially external systems. And indeed, when you approach them from the bottom, they look extraordinarily complex, an extraordinarily complex competitive environment, a myriad of different customers, products, rules, regulations, etc. All of this looks utterly impossible to deal with. You might lose hope that any changes could be made, but this would in fact be exactly the wrong approach to take. So systems then are really are the tool that allow you to operate in complex situations to make sense out of a world that looks too hard to deal with when you first look at it. When you think about the world in systems, what became uh, what was previously too hard because you were in the midst of the trees now becomes something that you can see because in essence that you are looking down from a top. If you have a complex environment, you need to approach it from a systems perspective. So let's take a look at an example of how we might use the concept of systems to deal with a market. To do this, we're going to establish a hypothetical situation, but one that actually prevailed at least in concept in the early days of the central processing unit. Let's assume that in those early days that there were three companies that were making central processing unit chips, integrated circuits, for the, the then fairly new personal computer, laptop computer market. Let's say that there was Intel and that there were two other companies. And to keep this very simple, let's assume that there was only one assembler and one seller of finished units. And let's call that, that organization compact, again, for simplicity. And then let's make the assumption that Compact was selling all of its uh, computers to just to one outside marketer, and that would be Office Depot. So what happens? Well, Compact is obviously sitting in the middle of this value chain. Compact goes to Intel and said, I, I need some uh, central processing unit chips for the computers. How much will you sell me one for? And Intel may say, well, we'll be happy to sell it to you for a dollar. Now, in reality, it was a bit more than that, but that simplifies the story a bit. Compaq says, thank you very much, and goes to CPU company number two and says, I need some chips. What will you sell them for? Well, they're kind of aware about what Intel is charging, so they say, we can sell these things to you for 95 cents. Compaq says, thank you very much, goes to company number three. Company number three says, boy, I'm going to get this job, I'll sell them to you for 85 cents. So what has happened is that Compact, because of the position that it has in the market system, has taken all of the value into its, uh, into its walls. Intel looks at this and says, you know, the thing that is really important about the computer is the central processing unit. How can I get some of that value back? I don't want it all going to Compact. So as they think about it a little bit, they say, well, what happens to a computer when it leaves the, uh, the factory at Compact? And again, for simplification, we say that it all goes to Office Depot. Is there anything that we could do to Office Depot that would 
create an advantage for us. And sure, we can send them some marketing materials and things like this, but so can the other companies. And so that probably is not going to do very much. What happens then? Well, the computer then goes to an end user. It may be a corporate user. It may be an individual. Can we do anything there? Their first thought is no, uh, because the central processing unit is very, very complex, and the user really doesn't have any kind of a clue whatsoever as to what that really is. Somebody then very smart says, well, suppose that we could get the end user to specify the kind of chip that they wanted to have in their computers. A little bit of thought about this says, that's very interesting. What that would basically be doing would be changing the uh, market process, the process about how people specify and buy computers. So if we could change that process, that could have an extraordinary impact on our business. Thus was born the concept of the marketing campaign, which came to be known as Intel Inside. And over a very short period of time, it basically taught end users to specify the chip that they wanted in their computer. Now when the end user goes to Office Depot, they say, I want a computer, but oh, by the way, it needs to be a computer that has one of those Intel chips in it. No, I don't want the kind that has the chip from company number two. It needs to be Intel inside. Office Depot says, fine, I don't care. They go back to Compaq and said, don't send us any more of those chip company number two and three computers because our customers all now are demanding the chips from Intel. Now Compaq says, okay, I've got a problem. They go back to Intel and say, uh, we need some more chips, more than we thought we were going to, uh, to need initially. How much would you sell us the chip for? And the Intel salesperson leans back in his chair a bit, and he says, well, you know, I think we can probably make you a pretty good deal. I think we can sell these to you for about $10. So all of a sudden, Intel, by changing the market, by changing the process through which people specified and bought computers, ends up bringing the value back into its walls and then goes on for many, many years to be an extraordinarily profitable company and subsequently expanded into other parts of the market system to create other things which drove people to buy and to want Intel chips, Intel inside. You can change a market system, and this is merely an example of how it can be done. Systems, markets, whether they are internal, external, are in fact complex. So how do we understand what is really in these different systems, external systems, internal systems? Well, fortunately, it turns out that all systems have a common design, a universal template, and it's fairly straightforward. All systems have a leadership element or elements, one or more entities that are trying to move the system in a particular direction, whether that's your market or whether that's your own organization. They all have a set of processes uh, around which they're built, energy conversion mechanisms. They all have infrastructure uh, of some sort. They all have demographic groups, a population ring, and they all have action units, the people, the, the organizations, the sub-organizations that actually go out and do the work of the system. Knowing that all systems have these characteristics, we then can begin to look for what we know needs to be in each one of these rings. There must be some centers of gravity in each one of those rings, some control points, some other elements that when we touch them are going to have an impact on the overall system. By having this particular view, it not only allows us to know what has to be in the system and thereby makes it easier to go through our center of gravity search, but it also begins to give us an idea of where value lies. Just from looking at this particular graphic, we might say that if we can affect things in the center, the leadership and the processes, it's probably going to have more of an impact than if we only affect something in the outer rings. Likewise, it gives us the idea that we probably, in fact, are going to have to affect more than one of these centers of gravity if, in fact, we are going to create system change. So we've been using the term centers of gravity now for some time. Let's talk a little bit more detail about what a center of gravity is. 
It's an element, a leverage point, that sits in one or more of the systems between you and achievement of your future picture. The systems need to change for you to move to your future picture. The way that you move systems is to change centers of gravity. Centers of gravity give you high return on your energy investment, whether those are dollars or time or anything else. If, in fact, your resources are limited, you must focus your efforts on finding and dealing with centers of gravity. My first experience with using centers of gravity in the real world was in the first Gulf War where we used the concept of the five rings and centers of gravity to put together the air campaign which was so successful and which had such a dramatic impact on the overall success of that first Gulf War. As you can see, at a strategic level, there were not a lot of centers of gravity in Iraq itself. You can see some leadership elements, you can see a few elements in the process ring, and so on and so forth. Now, obviously, as you began actually to deal with each one of these centers of gravity, you broke them down into component parts. So it wasn't that there were just a, a dozen targets. There were more than that. But this, at the highest level, depicted what the genuine strategic things were that you needed to affect if you were going to be successful in achieving your future picture for Iraq. Think about this in a way, from a business standpoint, as equivalent to your external system, to your market, in a slightly different way. Now, we mentioned before that there are always two systems with which you need to deal if you're going to be successful. In our case, the other system was our internal system. If we were going to be successful with the plan against Iraq, then clearly it had to be accepted within our own system, the United States, which meant that the president had to understand it and approve it. It meant that the Congress needed to approve funding for it. It meant that certain other things needed to be done in order to make us capable of achieving what needed to be done in that first Gulf War. So a handful of things, strategic centers of gravity, both externally and internally, then told you strategically what needed to be done, what the, what the leverage points were, what the focus points were in order to execute an operation very quickly and very successfully. Now, the majority of people who are watching this presentation are not in the business of putting wars together. The fact that this particular approach worked very well in a a highly competitive endeavor, which is, of course, what a war is, suggests that it also works quite well in other competitive endeavors, such as business. So now to link the military example with the business case, here is a hypothetical example of a company that may be in the business of building and distributing, selling some kind of a part that is in the, generally in the plastics world. So if we were trying to get to an increase in our business, we might need to change some aspects of the external system. So we would identify some leadership centers of gravity. And hypothetically, those leadership centers of gravity might be things like General Electric, the plastics division, as being the one that kind of defines how things are done. Uh, we might look at some of the leading assemblers for the, that use the parts that we're providing. We would then want to look beyond that, though. We'd want to look at who the customer's customer's customer was. We would want to look at the key media. Who, what, what are the, what are the, the magazines, the, the, the publications that people in this industry read that if they read favorable articles about our particular product might be inclined to buy them, use them, or something else of that sort? We might look at some processes. Maybe we can change the distribution system around. Maybe we can change the specification system around in such a way as to increase our ability to bring more value into our company and thereby move ourselves towards our future picture. Once we have dealt with our external system, and by the way, we always want to start with the external system because this is the one that people have the less familiarity with and are less inclined really to work on. But if you don't change the external system, you're not going to achieve what you otherwise might. Once we have dealt with the external system, however, that is, identified the centers of gravity that need to change within it, now it's time to change to our internal system. 
the centers of gravity within our own company. These are a little bit more straightforward and a little bit more familiar to us. Obviously, in the leadership area, that we'll have some people like our CEO or president. Uh, we might have chief operating officer, or chief financial officer. Within the processes, we may have centers of gravity that have to do with our marketing, with our sales, with our communications, and so on as we look across the other rings. Now, keep in mind that in all of these cases, we are not merely identifying all of the components of the external system or of the internal system. What we are doing is identifying the centers of gravity that are especially relevant, that need to change in some way if we are going to get to our future picture. We want to consider centers of gravity across all of the five rings. However, what we find as we look back through all kinds of, com of history of competition, whether that is war or business, that we get the best return on our efforts when we can change centers of gravity in the first ring, the leadership ring, or in the process ring. As we move farther out, we find that we spend more and more energy for less and less return. It doesn't mean that we can ignore third, fourth, or fifth ring centers of gravity. It just means that we need to know up front that the effort that we put into those are, are likely to deliver less for us than if we can do things successfully in the first two rings. So to date, we've talked about the where, the future picture. What, where are we going to be at a point in the future? And then to, to figure out the methodology for getting to that point in the future. We have talked about the necessity to create system change, external and internal, and we do that through identification of the centers of gravity. Our next step then moves into the how. Clearly, we need to change those centers of gravity in some particular way in order to, con to convert the external and the internal systems as required in order to get us to our future picture. Here, we begin to be especially concerned with the whole concept of time and what we call parallel operations. It's imperative to keep something in mind as we undertake any kind of operations at whatever level in whatever discipline, and that is time is our enemy. We frequently think that time may be on our side, but it never is on our side. It is always the enemy of enterprise, and always success is most likely in the short term. Even if it requires a long time to do something, we always need to be aware that the longer that we take to make something happen, the lower will be our probability of success. The way we deal with the time problem is straightforward. We do something called a parallel process, parallel operations. In the middle of the screen, you can see two sets of centers of gravity, one representing the internal system and one representing the external system. Our objective is to affect those centers of gravity in as compressed a period of time as possible in order to create the overall internal and external system changes that are necessary to take us to our future picture. An excellent example of parallel attack, of parallel operations, took place in the first Gulf War. We had identified a handful of centers of gravity, a very, very tiny uh, part of what could have been attacked in Iraq as critical elements. We brought these centers of gravity under very rapid attack in the first 24 hours and in many cases within the first hour of operation. The effect was dramatic. The results took place in days, not months or years. It was at a very low cost in blood and treasure, interestingly, on both sides. It broke the system elastic limits of the Iraqi system. It created a state of strategic paralysis, which in essence meant that the Iraqis simply could not respond in any kind of a reasonable way from their standpoint. We can capture the concept of parallel operations in what we call the time value of action with the curve that you will see here momentarily. Along the left side, we have the probability of success, which ranges obviously from high at the top to low at the bottom. 
along the horizontal or the x-axis, we are looking at the time required to affect the relevant centers of gravity to change whatever system is under consideration. If we want a high probability of success, we will bring as many centers of gravity as are necessary under attack or affect them in as short a period of time as possible. We call this the parallel domain. If we can affect things in the parallel domain, we have a high probability of success and we can do it at normally a relatively low cost of operations. As we move out in time, however, and as we move into the serial domain, all kinds of things begin to happen as you can see illustrated in the little red boxes. As we move out in time, things happen that are adverse to us and our probability of success begins to fall off dramatically while at the same time our overall cost of operations goes up far beyond what it would have been had we been able to do things in the parallel domain. So we end up with a rather anomalous results that our most expensive operations actually produce our lowest probability of success. This does not mean that you cannot be successful over a long period of time. It simply means that your probability of success is going to be low if you take a long time and that your cost of operations is going to be very, very high. If you are willing to accept both of those uh, considerations, then you can proceed. However, the ideal is always to figure out a way either to operate within the parallel domain or as a minimum to operate as close to it as possible. If we're going to be successful, we'll have, we have identified a certain set of centers of gravity. Those centers of gravity must change over some period of time in order for us to achieve our future picture. If we want a dramatically high probability of success at the lowest possible co uh, cost of operations, we're going to operate in the parallel domain, which means affecting the strategic centers of gravity in a short enough time frame that there can be no system reaction. In other words, we simply deal with all of the centers of gravity. We do something to them very, very quickly. We might ask ourselves whether that, in fact, can be done in the real world. And the answer is that although it can be difficult and that there are not a lot of examples, that there are examples. Two which come to mind are what Henry Ford did when he introduced the Model T Ford by changing many centers of gravity that had to do with production and marketing around the country so quickly that he moved from one of hundreds of manufacturers of automobiles at that time to by far the dominant manufacturer in a remarkably short period. Intel did much the same as we've already discussed when they began uh, marketing the central processing unit in the late 80s and the early 90s. The opposite to parallel operations is serial operations. Here we would take the same number of centers of gravity that would need to be affected but rather than trying to have an impact on all of them at the same time, we would choose one or two, we might call them low-hanging fruit or something of that sort, and simply deal with them in a serial way, one at a time, get one done, and then move on to the next. When we do this, what we do is to move ourselves way off into that timeline and significantly reduce our probability of success while dramatically driving up our cost of operations. Do people do this in the real world? The answer is most people most of the time and we can even look at some very dramatic illustrations such as Motorola in its Iridium project to try to build and market a satellite telephone system which they did in a very serial way and as a result lost uh, billions and billions of dollars and failed to accomplish what they had intended to accomplish. Serial operations are by definition expensive and dangerous. Suppose that we don't have sufficient resources or think we don't have sufficient resources to do a purely parallel operation. But on the other hand, we know for sure we certainly don't want to let ourselves move very far out into that serial world. Is there an alternative? And the alternative is to approach our problem through well-constructed phases. To do a phased approach to the future picture, 
we take our centers of gravity and identify some number which, when we have affected them, will have at least some impact on the overall system and will build us a stage from which to move on to the next area of success. In other words, in each phase of our operations, we not only have affected some of the centers of gravity, but we have changed the outside world, we have changed the inside world, and we have gotten some strategic indications, some strategic measures from the outside that, in fact, what we are doing makes sense and is putting us in the right direction. This will not give us the highest probability uh, that we could achieve, which can only come through a purely parallel effort. However, it does give us a significantly better chance of success than a serial operation, and once we have identified what our probability of success is and what the likely cost is going to be, it becomes a business decision. Is it worth trying or is it not? Once we have identified our phases, then we decide how to allocate our centers of gravity. Incidentally, part of the construction of the phase plan is actually doing it backwards. So we start with our future picture and determine what the external world and the internal world, our own system, need to look like at the time of realization of the future picture. And this actually is a fairly straightforward exercise. It doesn't depend on prediction. Once we have established what the two systems are going to look like at the realization of the future picture, then we can move backwards towards the current time to say, well, what would the preceding phase need to look like? And again, this is relatively straightforward, and then we do that again, and perhaps even again, until we are finally back to where we are right now. Now knowing what the phases are, what they're going to look like, having them quite well defined, we can take the centers of gravity we had previously defined and assign them to each one of the phases. Some will be done in the first phase, some will be done in the second, some might not be done until the third or a later phase of operations. In this way, we can divide up our work over time and make something that otherwise appeared impossible to be a manageable project. Once we've identified our centers of gravity, we then decide what each one of those centers of gravity must become. Once we know what they must become, it becomes time to start applying tactics against those centers of gravity to make them get to what we need them to be. We do this through the mechanism of campaigns. Campaigns are simply mechanisms or vehicles to pull everything together to use the people, money, and other resources in our organization in order to affect the centers of gravity, to change the systems, to take us to our future picture. They do a number of things which include making parallel operations possible and bringing a great deal of integration across an organization. So we now have done the where, our future picture. We have done the what, the systems, external and internal. We've identified the centers of gravity. We have determined the sequencing of changing the centers of gravity. And we've put the campaigns together that are going to start working against the centers of gravity. The last step in the strategy process is the, the exit process. And this is the one where we decide what we're going to do when we are successful or in the event that things don't go as anticipated, what actions are we going to take. And remember, this is something that we are going to do up front because this is the place that where we can do it without emotion and we can do it as rationally as possible. This particular graphic shows uh, rather dramatically how quickly things can change. So if we look on the left side of the graph, we can see that back in the 70s that if you wanted to have music at home, you played records. There, were no, there was no competition for records. At about that, that same time, cassettes began to appear, and within five or six years after the appearance of cassettes, they had displaced records. Records were in a collapse. Cassettes went up, and about the time that cassettes were hitting what turned out to be the peak, the, the compact disc, the CD, came along, and with an even shorter period of time, the CDs had overtaken the, uh, the cassettes and had made both the records and the cassettes irrelevant. Now, if we were able to extend this graph out in time, we would see the CDs in collapse being replaced with online, MP3, and a variety of other things. 
What this really tells us is that the world changes very, very dramatically. And if you think, if you had thought in the 1970s that records were here to stay, uh, you would now have be out of business and probably would have lost a great deal of money. There is a time to change. There is a time to exit. It's going to happen. It's going to happen to you. As we're thinking about exits, we need to keep in mind that there will be significant discontinuities, impossible events are going to take place, and sudden risk is going to happen. We don't need to go into the detail of this very much, but what these little charts are all illustrating are various places where things happen that everybody said would never happen. Russian and Brazilian bonds, long-term capital management, dramatic increase in its share value as, a, as one of the original big hedge funds run or significantly uh, directed by two Nobel Prize winners, all of a sudden collapses. Uh, one of the major companies in the dot-com boom goes to extraordinary heights and just as rapidly falls back down into nothing. And then finally down at the bottom, an illustration of how one in a billion year occurrences take place very regularly within the stock market. All of these things will happen. They will happen to your business. They will happen to my business. If we haven't thought about them in advance, we are going to be affected by them. And indeed, as we are now speaking here in 2009, we all have been affected by all of these things. So what that really tells us is that we simply have got to develop our end game well in advance. This all has to do with identifying exit points and subsequent plans to deal with those points in the event that they occur. An exit point is really nothing more than an inflection point. Something has changed in some particular way that tells us that we need to think about our strategy in a different way. It may tell us that we need to get out. It may tell us that we've been dramatically successful and, is now, and we're now ready to move on to the next point. What's really important about the whole concept of end game thinking is identification in advance of exit points and then creating the plans that we're going to follow in the event that those exit points take place. If we wait until they actually happen and then try to deal with them, what we always find is that emotion robs us of the ability to think rationally. We get into a, a, a mode of denial and we're simply unable to deal very well with the very, very dangerous things that are upon us. So in advance, however, we can think clearly about exit points. We can think clearly about the game plans that ought to accompany them. This is, in many ways, the very hardest part of strategy. And we could go so far as to say that if you don't think seriously about end game planning, and if you don't actually do it, by definition, you're simply not a strategist. So there clearly can be a large number of potential exit points. And, and these that you are looking at here are merely ex examples of some of the things that you might encounter as you are moving forward towards your future picture. Again, the real key is to think about these things in advance, to think very holistically about them, and to be willing to accept that the undesirable may well happen as well as the desirable. In addition to thinking about the where, the what, the how, and the exit, which we've been discussing, another very important part of the Prometheus process is what we call cardinal rules. The cardinal rules are strategic principles that if you follow them at both tactical and strategic levels, that you will normally do better than if you did not follow them. Some of them are pretty straightforward and are clear by their very name. Others, you need to hear the story. What these cardinal rules do, however, is once an organization has heard them and has begun to internalize them, is to give you a strategic vocabulary and a feeling of strategy across a whole organization. They also provide some fairly straightforward ways to evaluate how strategically you are behaving. So one of the very straightforward ways to assess yourself I, from a strategy standpoint is to simply take a few minutes every few weeks, every month or so, and go down through the cardinal rules and ask yourself, are, are we doing well with these uh, most of the time, some of the time, or do we need some work? 
and if you happen to end up in the right-hand column, as most organizations will when they first begin, then it's a matter of saying, okay, so we are in the right-hand column in one or more of these cardinal rules. What do we need to do about it in order to follow them more closely throughout the organization? The way we go about doing our strategy planning is quite important. If we ask an outside group to come in and give us the answers to our problems, they may come up with pretty good answers, but we normally will find we'll have a difficult time internalizing their ideas and then actually executing them. Likewise, even if we try to do a strategy inside and only have one or two people at the top, the owner, the board, the executive team, if those people put a strategy together and then issue it to everyone else, the chances for really good uh, understanding and execution are less than what they could be. The solution, we believe, is to follow this particular process, which is also a cardinal rule, and that is to plan and operate in the open. This means bringing as many people together as possible to help them actually to participate in the strategy formation phase. My first experience with this was actually in the planning of the first Gulf War. We had a very short period of time in which to put together a plan, less than two days. My first inclination as to how to go about it was to gather together a few people that I knew real well, close ourselves off someplace, put a guard outside the door, and come up with a brilliant plan. That would have been, in fact, the, the stupidest way to have approached the problem. And what we ended up doing was exactly the opposite. We took over one of the large rooms in the basement of the Pentagon in one of my divisions that was called the Checkmate Division. And rather than closing the doors and restricting access, we told people within the Pentagon, look, if you have some ideas, come on in. Let's hear them. By the end of our second day in planning, we had as m up to 300 people that were actually participating in this open planning uh, operation. It was extraordinary. What we found was that when you had a lot of people together in the same room, that there was almost always an answer for any question that you might have. And if there wasn't an answer, there was somebody in that room that knew somebody somewhere around the world that they could call in order to get an answer. This meant that the planning actually proceeded far faster than it otherwise might. Second, we found that the degree of commitment was awesome. People who participated in putting the strategy together believed in it and were willing to do whatever was necessary as we moved out in time to make it a reality. And third, we found that the people that had participated in this planning, when they later took over responsibility for subordinate operations at a theater level or someplace else, never had to refer back to headquarters, if you will, but in fact that they could figure out exactly how to deal with a changed tactical situation because they understood the strategy so well. Planning and operating in the open is essential. It is the most effective way to get the most ideas throughout an organization and get the most possible commitment to it. So what does strategy do? Well, it does a lot, but among other things, it brings focus. Specifically, the Prometheus strategy process will end up giving you a really high resolution, very well understood and accepted start to finish plan that's being executed by a strategically aligned group using a common strategic methodology and vocabulary. A lot of words strung together fairly quickly. What it really comes down to is strategy, strategic focus means that you have the majority of people in an organization, if not everybody, that understands what it is that they are trying to accomplish and doing the kinds of things that are necessary in order to take all of you to your future picture. The first time that I had an opportunity to use the Prometheus process was in the first Gulf War. And just a little short uh, account of that experience, I think, is probably useful. The Iraqis had invaded Kuwait in early August of 1990, and it came as quite a shock to Washington and the rest of the bureaucracy, the tendency of which was for that bureaucracy to treat the situation the same as the other situations with which it had dealt over the last 30, 40 years, and that was from a defensive standpoint. 
The problem was that we didn't have a defensive problem, that the Iraqis owned Kuwait and that they were going to keep Kuwait forever unless something was different and that something different was not going to be a defense of Saudi Arabia. Within a week of the time of the Iraqi invasion, General Schwarzkopf had called the Air Force Chief of Staff to ask if the Air Force had any ideas that might be useful to him at this point where he had no forces and little else to deal with this very different kind of a problem. Chief of Staff said that in fact that he knew that he had some people that had already begun to think about the problem and would be happy to come down and see him within a couple days and give him the ideas. He was a little surprised that something could be done within that time period, but said that he would be waiting. He was still at that time at MacDill Air Force Base in Tampa and had not gone to Saudi Arabia to take command in the field. During that next two days, in this checkmate operation, one of the divisions that they had in the basement of the Pentagon, we put together what we call a top-down plan. Now, a top-down plan simply means that you start with the strategy, not the tactics. You don't start with how many airplanes you're going to use or how many ships or anything else of this sort. You start with what is it that I want to accomplish? Where do I want to be? What am I going to put in my resources? How am I going to do it? And what are my exits? We put this together, took it down to General Schwarzkopf uh, on the 10th of August. He was quite pleased with what he, we presented him, asked us to take the plan to General Powell, who at that time was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. We did that the next morning, Saturday morning. General Powell, in turn, asked for a condensation of roughly the 20 viewgraphs that we had used in the presentation in order to present them to, uh, to a higher executive, which turned out to be the high executive, which he did then with the first President Bush a few days later and Kenny Bunkport. Then a few days after that, we were back with General Schwarzkopf, giving him a full campaign plan. And then by early in September, he was able to wire back to Washington, to the White House, to the uh, Secretary of Defense, saying that he was ready to commence operations if he was given the political uh, decision to do so. So this worked out pretty well, and since that first test, now almost 20 years ago, we have had the ability to refine it dramatically, to expand the literature that accompanies it, and to make it a much, much better process than it was at this particular time, even though it worked quite well. One of our clients adopted the Prometheus process at the end of 1999 among other things, that they determined that they wanted to increase the value of the business dramatically and also, as part of their future picture, that they wanted to win the Baldridge Award. The slide that you're looking at is the slide that this client, Bama Companies from Tulsa, Oklahoma, used in presenting to the Baldridge examiners. What this slide shows is the increase in valuation over the period of, of time since that they had adopted the Prometheus process up until the time of the Baldrige examination in 2003. As you can see, that they had made significant progress in increasing the value of their company and attributed a reasonable portion of their success to the fact that they had followed the Prometheus strategy process. Well, not only had they been very successful in increasing the value of their company, but they also were the 2004 winner of the Baldrige Award in the manufacturing category. Quite a high honor for a relatively small company in Tulsa, Oklahoma. The slide you're looking at now is a slide that was presented by the Director of Strategy at the West Coast Conference Board in 1999 in a discussion about strategy. If you look on the left side of the slide, you will see that the uh, market capitalization of Texas Instruments had been low for a number of years. The, ex the board of the company and the senior executives of the company were really not happy with the fact that the market wasn't valuing them for what they thought that they were really worth. They thought that their engineers were as good as anybody's, if not better, that their products were as good, if not better, than anybody else's, and it simply didn't make sense. Why were they not getting the kind of reward that clearly was theirs? In the early 1990s, they began to decide that what their real problem was not tactical execution, they were doing fine in building products and running uh, fabs and the other things that a high-tech company does. What they decided their problem was was an insufficient attention on strategy. 
So in the early 1990s, they began doing a number of things to improve their, uh, their understanding and their execution of strategy. We were fortunate enough to be able to join them in that effort in 1995, 1996, and to give them some ideas that were, were helpful in allowing them to significantly increase their market value and thus gather the rewards that clearly belong to a very, very capable, very high-tech company. It isn't that it was the Prometheus strategy process that by itself contributed, made these results happen. It was that it was a part of the whole strategy process and the emphasis on strategy that allowed the company to be so successful without significant changes in its tactical prowess. So we've talked about a lot of things during the last hour or so. Some of them seem a bit complex, and indeed that you may need a little bit of additional support from manuals or other things in order actually to execute it. But now you have the essence of strategy. You have the essence, you have the concept of the where, where am I going to be in the future, what am I going to put my resources against, how am I going to do it, and how am I going to manage time, and exits, am I ready to change when change is demanded. So if you simply do nothing more than answer those questions to the best of your ability, follow the cardinal rules, you will find that your chances of being successful are significantly higher than they otherwise would have been. In the final analysis, however, remember that strategy really has two purposes. One of them is to reduce the chance of failure. The other one is to increase the probability of success and admonition, don't leave home without it. <laughs>